Welcome, welcome to the mysterious book Emporium. Our heroes have somehow found themselves traveling the Alluvians with their enemy, awaiting to find the end to duel for the fate of the Empire. Who will win the crown and take over the Alluvian network? Why don't you take a seat as we finish The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks, Chapter 16 through the epilogue. Chapter 16. Sir Michel has counted four knights since they teamed up with Gaspard to travel the Alluvians. Four knights are trying to ignore the Empress sharing a blanket with her elven lover, Briala. Gaspard catches Michel staring, asking if it's odd to see the Empress have a love life, to which he agrees. Gaspard asks if he has feelings for her, which he declines. The two then talk about honor, and Gaspard brings up that he regrets sending out the bard to collect information on him. Michel knows that if he asks what he knows, he could give up his secrets, so he plays it cool. After talking a bit, it's clear that Gaspard knows nothing of his elven heritage. All those nights worrying that it will come back to hurt him, all the fear he has had of losing everything melts away. Gaspard doesn't know. He is safe. The next day, Selene leads them into a large chamber. In the center of the room is a mess of rooms and a pedestal in the middle. The elves in the group say that to their eyes, they can see a path through the runes. Gaspard turns to the others, saying that now that they are in the central Alluvian chamber, it's time to duel for the crown. But Lien interjects that something else is happening. Something is awakening. Something old and angry. A large Vartarel comes loose from the ceiling and crashes down on the group then. Phyllison shouts to get to higher ground as the beast cannot see, only feel through vibrations in the floor. The other scramble to stand on the benches circling the room. They attack the beast with little progress when Duke Ramash begins to attack Selene instead. Gaspard yells for him to stop as this is not the time. She is knocked in the path of the Vartarel and is only knocked away by Sir Michel, who is grabbed instead. Briala watches as Selene runs for the beast, ducking under it to stab at its underside, making it drop Michel. In an unusual move, the Empress has risked her life for her champion. Gaspard catches up with Ramash then, yelling about his lack of honor. With ease, he kills him and turns to Selene to apologize for his behavior. Gaspard also turns to Briala, taking off a ring and giving it to her. She is shocked, recognizing it as the same type of ring that Selene wears and was given to her by Lady Matillion. Where did you get this? Briala asked, as Selene slashed at the Vartarel's legs and drew its attention away from Michelle. Lady Matillion, he said, raising an eyebrow at her question. After the first time I impressed her in the game. The Vartarel was there, roaring in anger, crushing stone, but for a moment all Briala could see was a reading room with blood on the floor, Selene pulling her from her hiding spot, a new ring on Selene's finger. The group continues to fight with the beast cornering Briala. As she fires one last killing shot into its belly, she notices Selene nearby. She hesitates toward Briala, then stays still, and the beast crashes down onto Briala. Selene had risked her life for Michelle, but not her own lover. Briella awakens with Michelle and Gaspard pushing the Vartarel off of her. Selene looks genuinely happy that Briella has survived. And now, Gaspard calls that it's time for the duel. Chapter 17 Although nervous, Selene stands before Gaspard. She tells him that her champion, Michelle, needs to be healed before the battle, and he agrees. She thinks back to watching Briella almost get crushed. She had done everything she could, short of getting killed herself. It was not easy to think about. The two set the rules for the duel. Armed combat between Gaspard and Michel. No magic other than any items that are on them. Lien then heals Michel and the two parties spread apart. Lien, Miris, and Gaspard on one side of the room and Michel, Felisson, Briala, and Selene on the other. Selene asks Felisson to watch Lien and Miris as she believes they will cheat in the duel without Gaspard's approval. Selene and Briala take a moment alone and Selene tells her lover that it's almost over, that she will soon free her people. You would give me that amazing gift. Her finger still twined through Selene's, toyed with the ring on Selene's hand. Gifts. When did Lady Mantelio give you this one? Selene pulled her hand free. She tucked the keystone ruby into a pouch at her waist and held up her hand and looked at the puzzle ring, intricate twining safe she could never quite follow. You know, I'm not certain I remember. It was after my father died and I was alone. She must have felt sorry for me, an orphan in the court. Yes, I, I recall now. She said it would help me keep my wits about me, that I might need them. It was a bittersweet story. In another life, it might have even been true. Briala nodded and another tear fell, sparkling for a moment on the blue dragskin armor on her leg. Of course. She looked up at Selene and though her eyes were wet, she smiled. I never thought you lost your wits. It was one of the reasons I always loved you. She leaned over and with surprising force pulled Selene into a kiss. Her soft lips were urgent this time, her breath hot as Briala traced kisses down Selene's jaw and throat. 
Briella's strong arms wrapped around Celine, pulling her closer as Celine returned the kiss, and her hands gripped Celine tight, cradling Celine's neck and waist. I will never forget this, Briella whispered, and then she pulled away. Celine then goes over to Michel, handing him her rings to help him fight in the battle. Michel and Gaspard begin their duel, and Briella then notices that Michel is slipping up in ways that was unusual to him. Lien is hexing him. Celine calls to Gaspard to stop the duel, but they cannot hear her. Miris is blocking the sound. Celine calls for Felisan to stop the magic, but Miris taunts that it wouldn't be a good idea as something might cross the veil. Briella pipes up then that she should know. Celine is confused, Lien backs away, and Felisan laughs, asking Briella when she knew. She explains that in the camp, Miris' staff glowed a different color, and she wasn't a very talented mage. Leanne stares at Miris in fear, in which Briella stabs her, according to her plan. Leanne threatens her, saying that she would be killed for this, to which Briella calmly says that, well, then she should kill her first, and slits her throat. With the hex over, Michelle begins to fight normally again. Miris then raises her hand, wanting to kill Michelle, but Briella calls her by her real name now, Imshale. She goes on to explain that Imshell's deal was for Miris to choose to kill Sir Michel. When she didn't kill him after Gaspard asked her to stay her hand, she had made her choice. The deal was over. Imshell, speaking through Miris, explains that all was well and good, but he is here to feast on the fear of the people, and he's not leaving till he gets it. Selene tries to offer him that she will free the elves, which will cause a lot of chaos in the Empire, but he is bored by her offer. You know, you've got a good point, Felicen said. Fire and swords are dull, but what if something bigger was coming? I'm listening, Slow Arrow, said the demon. What could you possibly do that you and I have not seen a hundred times before while the sweaty mortals lusted and grappled and bled their lives away? Felison said nothing, just smiled, twisting the tattoos around his face. Oh my, Imshel breathed. Is that a promise? Well, I was going more for a threat. Imshel turned to Selene, who stared at him uncertainly. Empress, he said. Best of luck to you. I do believe you're going to need it. Whatever happens, I believe that Orlé is going to be quite exciting for the next little while. And with that, Imshel is gone. Miris lies on the ground, Lien is dead, and Michel and Gaspard are fighting as Selene watches. Briala looks to Felisan. Michel and Gaspard continue to fight, and even though Michel has a sword broken, he is able to beat Gaspard. But before he is able to strike the killing blow, Briala calls out to them, asking to call in a debt on Michel. She asks him to yield. Celine yells out to Briala, asking what she is doing, but her face is void of all emotions. Felisan begins to laugh. She then yells at Michel to finish Gaspard, but he just stares at her. He calls out that he is her champion, Sir Michel de Chavin, but he is also the bastard of an elven mother. So he will yield. Selene thinks about her empire and all that she is losing in this moment. The full libraries, the busy merchant wagons, hot tea and small fingers gently taking the mask from her face. She draws daggers at Briala. Tell me again how you will free my people. I gave you my word, Selene stepped forward, a dagger raised. I swore, and I think I even believed you, Briala swallowed. But when the nobles protested and threatened to weaken the empire, you would have let it go. You always have ignored your promises to me, knowing that I would always forgive, that I would always stand at your side. Now her blades came out. After all, I believed in you even after you killed my parents. Selene waved it away. That was Lady Mantillion, whatever you think. Gaspard, Briella shouted. When did Lady Mantillion give you your ring? Gaspard had sunk to his side, leaning against one of the benches. After I'd proven my worth. And how did you do that? Briella didn't look over. Her eyes were locked on Selene's. Gaspard coughed. I ordered a man's death as part of the game. Selene begs Briala, saying that Lady Matillion would have never backed her if she didn't kill her servants, as they knew too much about the plan to overthrow the current emperor, and if Gaspard won, he would have killed her. Gaspard calls out to her that he would have never killed her. Married her off to a distant noble, perhaps, but he would have never killed a girl. Gaspard and Selene begin to argue if the duel counted or not, as Gaspard would have technically won due to Michelle's yield, but then they notice that Briella has begun to walk the rune path. Selene is confused as to why, as Briella doesn't have the ruby, but her hands fly to her sides. It's missing from her pockets. The kiss they shared earlier was so forceful. Briella had stolen it from her before the duel even started. She chases after Briella, but is stopped by a field. She raises a dagger to throw, but Selene is blasted by ice from Miris. They all watch as Briella walks a path only she can see, 
Place the ruby on the pedestal, whisper a phrase only she can hear, and unlock the alluvians for her. A wave of red light splashes across the room, and for a moment, all the alluvians activate. Briala, with the magic having passed through her, is able to know where the alluvians lead, and sends Gaspard and Michel away together. Celine meets Briala, who is protected by both Felisan and Miris. She then asks where Celine would like to go, to which she answers Valreo. Briala thinks for a moment. Putting Celine in the center of her power would end the war too quickly, and she wouldn't be able to continue on with her own plans, so she directs her to another alluvian. Go then, she said, nodding to hide the implicit lie. Fight for your university, your culture. I will fight for the others who have no one to champion their cause. Celine swallowed. I will fight to save this empire, Priya. And I will take joy in my love finding her people, even as my breast aches with every heartbeat I live without you. Celine walks alone to the mirror, and with a quiet phrase, Briella awakened it. As does mine, she whispered as Celine had disappeared. Epilogue. Briella, Felison, and Miris walk out into the light of the snowy dales. Miris asks if perhaps Briella would share the knowledge of the Alluvians with the Dalish, but she laughs in her face. The Dalish left the city elves to die, so she will be helping them, not the Dalish. Miris becomes shy, saying that she tried to help and that she isn't her enemy. Briella gets softer, saying that she will not forget about the Dalish. They are still her people, but she will only work with the Dalish if they work with her and all of the elves. She tells Miris to pass it on to the next keeper she sees. Miris asks if she could perhaps go to Felison's clan, but he refuses, although he does wish her well. When she leaves, Felison asks Briala a question. Are you sincere? You will use the pass of the Alluvians to help your people? Briala thought for a moment. Selene and Gaspard saw an army, but that would be fighting their fight. With the paths, I could get food to alienages where elves would otherwise starve. They would let me move ahead of an upcoming army and warn the target, or move behind them and attack their supply lines. Which army are you going to hamstring? Briala looked over to Felisan, smiling, even as she started to shiver from the winter's chill. Whichever one seems to be winning. What was it, Inaris and Andrul? Felisan smiled. You prolong their fight, and in the chaos, your people work free from their bonds? It can work, I think. Briala held her arms around her. Helm Sharal rioted because of a single nobleman. I could find elves who will help me with my work in every city in Arlay, and more who are too afraid to fight but will serve as eyes and ears if I can help their children survive the winter. That is, Felisan said, and after a pause, finished a unique use of the ancient relics of our people, Dalen. I think Venheral would have approved, Briella said, and saw Felisan give a startled laugh. He might have, her teacher said, although I very much doubt it. Oh, I almost forgot, she said. The pass right to access the Alluvians in case we're separated, it's... She broke off as his finger brushed her lips, looking at him in surprise. Felison smiled again, but his eyes were sad and wiser than Briala could ever imagine. Don't. Briala realizes then that he means to leave. She asks if he will go back to the Dalish. He laughs, saying that he never would. He tells her that the Elves of Orlais are in good hands. Others are not. So he has work to do. Though her eyes sting, she doesn't beg him to stay, because the wisest man she has ever known said that he trusted her, and she trusted his judgment. She asks him one last question. Was all of this, the Dalish clan, the Alluvians, the journey, breaking free of Selene, was this his plan? He chuckled one last time. No, Delenn, you did this to yourself. He leaned in and kissed her gently on the forehead. His lips burned like a brand and her head spun for a moment. When she opened her eyes again, she was alone. And though she had looked in all directions, no tracks marked which way Felisan had gone. Briala looked back at the tunnel. She was no longer shivering. Perhaps Felisan had left her some trace of his magic to guard her against the winter chill, or perhaps simply having a purpose warmed her. She mouthed the past phrase, and the tunnel closed behind her as if it had never existed. Then Harel and Asal, the Dreadwolf's Blessing. Celine finally exits the Alluvian to find herself back in the Winter Palace in Halem Sharal. She thinks that she would have done the same in Briala's shoes and is not actually surprised. She had lost everything, but some part of her laughed. She felt like that 16-year-old girl again, alone in Orlais, and last time, she had won. She sneaks to her room and rings a bell for her servants. A moment later, a very confused woman is shocked to find her empress. She bathes and is dressed while a seneschal tells her the news of what Gaspard has done while she was away. He also tells her that Lord Pierre is currently marching to the Winter Palace to call for her surrender. She meets him in the entryway of the palace then. 
I have come as you requested, he said, and I am prepared to show every kindness to you and your staff. Rest assured, this is a difficult time for us all, as I can attest to the state of Halam Shara itself, and is no dishonor to surrender in the face of such force. As he started talking, Selene descended from the stairs. She had timed it perfectly, courtesy of years of practice, and came into view from the entry hall just as Lord Pierre finished speaking. I am pleased to hear you say such noble words, Lord Pierre, and for Selene of Orlais said as Lord Pierre stood there looking dumbfounded. And while in darker times an emperor might have had his lord executed on the spot for such disloyalty, I find my heart moved by your speech. She smiled as she reached the bottom of the stairs, and her palace guard stepped out to flank her. And so I accept your surrender. Lord Pierre of Holland Chiral was a good, kind man, but he had never been a strong one. He had not had the will to curb the elven rebellion himself, nor the courage to defy Gaspard, and neither of those things surprised Celine. After a moment, Lord Pierre dropped to one knee, and that did not surprise her either. Empress, Celine had been back only a few hours, and she had already taken her first city. Michel and Gaspard find themselves near Valchevin. The two had talked while they traveled, and Michel ended up telling Gaspard about the, the whole truth of who he was. Gaspard asks him what he will do now that he is no longer in Celine's employ. Gaspard says that the wound he got from his duel with Michel likely ended his fighting career. Gaspard then asks why Michel didn't kill him when Briala called on her debt. But why keep it? Gaspard insisted. You're not really a chevalier, son. Michel reached for a sword that wasn't there, then drew his dagger instead. The chevaliers wish to strip my name from the rolls and kill me. That is the right, he said, staring at Gaspard down the length of his blade. But they will not take my honor, and I will not stand to have it insulted. See, said Gaspard and smiled. That is why I won't report you to the academy. Michel blinked. I don't understand. Sir Michel, Gaspard shook his head. You beat me in a fair fight. You held your honor even when it cost you everything. You're the damned model of a chevalier, no matter what blood runs in your veins. He looked behind them again to where the tunnel had been. Two hundred years ago, they'd killed a woman for doing the same thing, and then along came Sir Aveline and Trey and changed the rules. Michel had lowered his dagger as the Grand Duke spoke. He sheathed it now, speaking quietly as he did. So you will let me remain a chevalier? You are a chevalier. What you do with it is up to you. Gaspard tells him that he won't insult Michel by asking him to join his cause, but Michel will live, as the Empire needs more honorable men. He shakes his hand, and then the two part ways. Michel thinks on where to go, who to be, now that he has lost his cause. There was only one more debt he carried, that he freed Emshale. It might take his entire lifetime, but it was possible. So he heads in a random direction in search of his new life. In the darkness that night, the elf known as Felisan makes a fire deep in the woods. He eats well and thinks a moment. He had the herbs to keep him from dreaming. He could stay away and travel around Thetis. But he thinks on Sir Michel. That boy had held to his word, and he wouldn't be outdone by him. He brings out a special mix of herbs and places them on the fire, and he begins to dream. He dreams of the campfire he is currently at, and soon after, he hears leaves crunching behind him. I don't have the passphrase. Thelassan said, not turning around. Briala did not tell me. It was a lie of sorts. She would have told him, had he not stopped her. And the figure behind him heard the lie and knew it as well. Yes, I know. She deserves a chance, Thelassan said. And what's the harm, really? Why not let the girl try? Behind him, there was only silence. There would be no debate. No logical argument or impassioned plea. Thelassan had known that when he sat down before the campfire. Thelassan sighed. I'm sorry. I will not take the alluvians from her. Dead leaves crackled again as the figure came closer behind him. Felson closed his eyes, straightened, and inhaled the rich scent one last time. They're stronger than you think, you know, he smiled. You know, I suspect you'll hate this, but she reminds me of you. He never heard the blow that killed him. His last thoughts was of an elven girl alone, with no magic, no family, no power, searching for her people. Discussion I'm not sure if this is just an error in my book or not, although in previous book emporiums, the errors seem to stay across versions, but at one point it mentions that Briala has a ring given to her by Lady Matillion, when it should actually be Selene. Briala does not have a ring by Lady Matillion, and if she did, it would actually break the logic of the novel, as her knowing how to get the ring is a major step in figuring out that Selene is the one who murdered her parents. Something that is brought up in the book, but not in my summary, is that you should remember in the start of the novel to the woman who was complaining about the food, which caused the Chatelatain to threaten to whip all the elven servants. Lienne is that noblewoman's daughter, and Briala does take some satisfaction in killing her for that. 
and really those couple points is really all I wanted to bring up in the discussion. Ah, I'm kidding. No, we have a lot more. <laughs> it's just but, but most of the other points I have ties into the whole novel. So for the most part, get ready for just a long talk that kind of discusses like, the, the novel in its entirety. So let's go through all the stuff that I have put off. Something I mentioned early on was that a decent amount of fans consider Briala to be whitewashed in Dragon Age Inquisition. Much like I did with Fiona in The Calling, I wanted to really examine that. So here I've collected all that I could find that describes what Briala looks like. I may have missed some line, I, I think that's entirely possible, but for the moment these are what I'm basing my judgement on and this is the best I can do. Her elven lover made soft sleeping sounds and Selene stroked her hair absently. The black curls lightened to gray with the pre-dawn light, then slid to the light brown as cinnamon as the sun brought color to the room. Dirt brown, Selene had called it when Brigala had waited upon her as a girl. Horse dung brown, an ugly shadow of Selene's spun gold locks. While it does say that she has black curls, it's during the dark, and then it lightens to a cinnamon color when the sun is shining on it. I think the best idea that we can get of its true color are actually the rude remarks that Celine uses in her childhood. Briala has dark brown hair. Her skin was darker than Celine's, though she spent most of her days inside and showed no tan lines at the bare skin around her eyes. Briala tried to ignore it, but Celine knew that she was quietly ashamed of it. Not the ears that gave her away as even Elvin behind the mask. Not the lovely liquid eyes, but her sun-touched skin dotted with a spray of pretty freckles. Briala has freckles. Her skin is sun-touched, but she has no tan lines and she stays out of the sun her most of the time, and that skin tone is darker than Celine's. Briala's eyes were so large and dark in the morning. Briala has dark eyes, at least in the morning. Now this could be that her pupils are so dilated in the morning as elves, and as elves has really large eyes, it makes them seem a lot darker than they really are. Her lover's skin was dark against the creamy white satin of her nightshirt. Briala's skin is darker than her white shirt. Now granted, this scene is taking place as they wake up, so it's possible it's dark around them with very little light, although it's not actually described. So let's summarize. Briala has dark brown hair that is curly, skin darker than Celine's, and looks like she was in the sun when she wasn't. She has freckles and dark eyes in the morning. Now in game, Briala doesn't have freckles. This is something that is plausible to do, but they don't do it. So that's a minus. She also doesn't have curly hair, which I will say isn't actually possible with Dragon Age Inquisition hairstyles available in the vanilla game, unless you do one of the short cropped hairstyles. So I'm willing to give it a pass. If they wanted to make Briala black, they definitely could have done it because they do have the hair for it, even if it is short cropped. So, I don't know if that's a neutral one or a minus, I'll let you decide on that one. In game, her eyes are a lighter color, but then again, the book never really gives a solid color for her eyes, or at least that I could find. Just that they were dark in the morning, and that could just be her pupils dilating, so I'm gonna just pass that along as well. And now, her skin tone. The whole novel, the only one who comments on her skin tone is Celine and it is always compared to her own skin. Celine is described as being extremely pale, and in the game she is. She is the most pale you can get. So compared to Celine, I do think that the skin tone for Briala is a valid one. In the mind of Celine, Briala's skin tone would like would look like suntan skin, yet she has no tan lines and is mostly indoors. In short, I don't think Briala was whitewashed here. Now I do think it's also a valid argument for people who found her looks extremely disappointing. When people read the novel, dark curly hair and tan skin does sound a lot like a person with African descent. I think it's completely valid reading to view her as darker as well, just that the game decided to smash that idea. So while I completely disagree that Briala is whitewashed because I think it's really just poor communication, I do think that there is a fair argument that she is, or at the very least, her looks disappointed fans. And all of this is compared to Fiona, who I, I don't think that argument even holds water. Fiona is not whitewashed. But then again, this overall is a personal opinion, and if you don't like mine, then that's fine. But I, I think if we want to get technical, Briala's looks in the book mostly matches her in the game. It's just not what people thought of and could be very misleading. So I get the outrage at the same time I disagree with it. So I've been putting this off for a while, but let's talk about Felisan, huh? First, who killed him? Well, this was probably one of the most debated things about this book for a while. While I won't go into the full argument, the gist of it was, would it make sense that Solas slash Felisan would be the one to kill him? A lot of people didn't see him as the type of person to do so. 
So really, up until Trespasser, there was this back and forth until Cole had this comment to say. His friend had to die because he thought they were people. A slow arrow breaks in the sad wolf's jaws. So now we have context as to what Solus was thinking. Now, while it is debatable if Solus was the one to actually do the deed, as it could be one of his agents, what is clear is that the act was approved by him, although he wasn't pleased to do it. As the heart of the argument was really about if Solus would kill Felisan, this confirmation pretty much stopped the conversation as to who actually killed him. Who did it really doesn't matter, because Solus either did it or ordered it and is therefore responsible. This confirmed murder would also be fairly ironic, as a large part of Solus' story in Dragon Age Inquisition is that he can either keep his ideas of the people of Thetis, or actually see them as people like Felisan, if not even fall in love with one of them. Solus basically murders one of his own for a crime he will later commit, or possibly at least depending on your choices. What is also important about this, it sends a message about how Solus runs his organization. Something that is also hinted at in his dialogue with Sarah, those who are not working towards the goal are eliminated. Felisan, whose clear allegiance is with his people the entire novel, has grown soft and grew fond of Briala. She reminded him too much of the people he knew, of real people he began to see that perhaps what Solus's plan is wrong, became dangerous, and was killed. The end is pretty much the opposite of what Solus does in Dragon Age Inquisition if friended or romance. He realized that he is in the wrong, but continues on with the path. In essence, Felisan and Solus actually have the same character arc, but Felisan isn't as prideful as Solus and actually changes his mind. From Anana, Damn, Solus killing Felisan with cold blood, and for what? We're seeing today's people as people? And later, exactly the same thing happens to Solus himself if you romance slash befriend him in Inquisition. Wonder if he ever regretted killing Felisan. From the above clip, I do think Solus regretted it, but in the end, it seems to just be a larger pile of regrets that he just seemingly ignores. Now, second, something that has come up time and time again is if Felisan is actually dead. This is more a theory, but stated time and time again in the series, mages who die in the Fade are made tranquil. On top of that, Solus mentions that becoming tranquil is worse than death, and constantly is against wasting potential in people. So, about the latter half of that, I cannot see a world in which Solus wouldn't know that killing him in the Fade would make Felis untranquil. So if he is, he would be doing so deliberately, despite being so against even the thought of it. The mages you can judge in Dragon Age Inquisition, he strongly disapproves of being made tranquil, no matter who they are, but approves if they are executed. I would be shocked that Solus would make him tranquil on purpose. And while killing someone in the Fade and making them tranquil is talked about time and again, something that isn't stated that much in this argument is that dreamers, or mages who are talented in waking the Fade, were known to be able to actually kill people through their dreams. As Solus is probably the most powerful dreamer that we know of, I think it's possible that Solus can and has killed people from the Fade. The text itself also mentions his last thoughts. Trank will still have thoughts, so why would this one be his last? So, at least for me, I do think Felisan is dead and not Tranquil. Now, could he still come back? Possibly. He's one of the most well-liked characters in the novels, and might be the most talked about character that doesn't actually appear in any of the games, probably due to his connection with Solus. So it wouldn't be out there to assume that he might come back, and besides the point, characters who were deader have seemed to make comebacks. So while I believe he is dead, that doesn't mean we won't see him again. And third, let's talk about the man rather than his fate. Felisan, despite not really saying that much in the novel, is easily the most memorable character in the novel, in my opinion at least. While he jokes and makes smart remarks, he makes it known that he is capable and dangerous. Even Briala, who is easily the closest person to him, has so many questions about him that she will never ask out of fears of his reaction. I had a comment ask how I knew Felisan was an ancient elf, and as you read through the novel, the text does pretty much all but outright say it. He says that he is not a city elf or a Dalish, as he sees both as foolish. The way he talks about Fen'Harel mostly towards the end seems to be in a way that suggests that he knew the man. His magic and knowledge of ancient elven ruins, relationship with Imshale, and knowledge of the past that could only be explained that he is from Arlathan, or at the very least, very, very old. Something that is subtle is that while Briala talks about having a mother and a father, her memories only really talk of her mother. While I'm sure she loved her father, it seems that she now views Felisan in a fatherly light. 
She opens up to him, seeks his advice, and trusts him more than any character in the novel. Even Celine, when she was on good terms with her. Felisan, as well, has stepped up to his fatherly role, and I think really does see Briala, if not as a daughter, at least his successor in freeing the elves. Another thing I've put off until the end, now with all of this information, who should you put in place on the throne of Orlay? Well, I won't dig too much into this, let's just do a basic overview. Selene is a master manipulator and in general wants to use her power to develop resources for her people to better their minds. So things like schools and the arts and theaters. She prefers to think inside her own borders, believing the best way to deal with the other nations is diplomacy. On the downside, she doesn't know much of war and was easily outmoved by Gaspard and his men. If Orlais were in a war, she would probably be the least likable candidate. Gaspard, while not a master, is skilled in manipulating to get what he wants, although he is much more straightforward about it. He rarely hides his intentions and prefers to put the subject of his manipulation in binds that they cannot get out of, rather than predicting their movements. His idea of power is one that makes Orlais seem powerful. He was all too willing to go to war of Herelden just to get the crown. He takes his honor very seriously and rewards those who do the same, even able to break tradition in favor of his values. Despite the reputation he gets of being anti-Elven, he actually isn't that bad to them. He treats them with almost the same amount of respect that Selene does. Selene only differs in that she is able to entertain the idea that the Elven people are equals to humans because of Briala, while Gaspard takes the other side just to gain forces against her. I have no doubts in my mind that if the situation were reversed, he would have no issue being pro-Elven. Both Selene and Gaspard view the Elven people as tools. Gaspard is just more blunt about it. From Anana, like, I started to like Gaspard? Don't get me wrong, he is a horrible and racist person, but he has some kind of charm. I didn't get this vibe from him in the game. I especially liked when he killed Ramash and when he promised to keep Michelle Heritage a secret. He is a bastard, but not without honor. And that's what's great about this novel. It gives more nuance to the Wicked Eyes Wicked Hearts choice. Gaspard isn't this evil ruler who does crazy things and will murder all the other people. He's actually a pretty chill dude, he just wants to keep Orlay mostly as it is, and to some, that's a problem. Briala, on the other hand, is a more middle ground between Gaspard and Selene, but also more violent than the other two. She's willing to get what her and her people need by any means necessary. She's very passionate about her people and has given up a lot to free them. The question in her ruling, or more accurately, puppeteering Gaspard, if she can actually free them. As Felisan asks her, when the elves are free, who will mop the floors? While the question was directed at Selene, it applies to anyone who will attempt to free the elves. The empire is based on having a large amount of servants, and the main question to that is what happens when that is taken away? This is a huge question for Briala to answer, and one that will likely cause chaos. This is made worse that Gaspard, the strongest of the group, is her puppet, and seeing the chaos will likely work against her. So if you are pro-Elven, then it would make more sense to reunite Selene and Briala, where a more moderate and calm solution could probably be found. The question is, should you reunite them? I think that overall, the matter of should you is actually very irrelevant on two accounts. The first is that what really matters in the situation is what's best for the Empire, not Briala and Selene. It's clear that they are not in a healthy relationship, but does that matter if their unhealthy relationship brings peace and freedom for Orle and the elves? Remember that they have been together for almost 15 years and were actually doing very fine up until then. I don't think the Empire is in fear of them breaking up and causing chaos. I think that they could do fine together. Second, something that they teach you when training to be a therapist, and I know I talk about this all the time and I apologize, is that you get clients who come in to work on the relationship and you will likely be against them doing so. But within the code of ethics for the trade, you are taught to forego your opinions in this situation, unless there is obvious physical or mental harm going on, which this is not the case for Selena Briala. But you do this because the couple has come to you to fix the relationship. They want to try again, and as a professional, you are tasked to do that. So what does this have to do with Briala and Selene? For those who don't remember or haven't done it, to get the two back together, all you need to do is find the locket that Briala gave to Selene in the Empress's possession and show it to both of them. 
Selim will say that, oh, it was a mistake to keep it, but it's kind of hinted at that she does want to keep it, but she it wants to save face. And then Briala will be shocked that Selim would risk so much by keeping it. And then in your final decision, your Inquisitor just makes to make one small comment that Briala helped them to save Selim. And then bam, they're together again. All it took to save the relationship was to show the other that they still cared. That's literally it. I don't think it matters what they did in the past because they still want to be with each other. And for me at least, that's enough to justify their relationship. Again, they have probably been together close to 15 years and seem to have a really good relationship before then. It seems even the blood on their hands can't stop their feelings for one another. Which me as a person don't get, but apparently Brielle and Celine do, and that's all that really matters in the end. So while this novel sets up a major plot point now that there is an underground network of elven spies and that this is even something that Briala mentions to the Inquisitor as a bargaining piece for her side in Wicked Eyes, Wicked Hearts, the actual conclusion to this is super underwhelming. While we have a whole novel on Briala gaining access to the Illuvians, do you want to know where that ended? And that's it. Briella lost the Alluvians to Solus. Whoops, we never find out if he knew the password was in his honor or even Briella's reaction, which as Trespasser takes place in Holland Shiral is such a missed opportunity for at least a line of dialogue explaining that she has lost something major to her goal and she's upset about it. Hell, for all we know, Briella might even have joined forces with Solus. Literally anything could have happened because we have nothing to go on here. Either way, despite what this novel ends on, Briella no longer has the Alluvians. Although she may still have the ability to sense where Alluvians will take her, that's really about it. With the novel over, what else carries over to other media? Well, a large part of the cast actually shows up in Dragon Age Inquisition, more so than any of the other books to games. Miris comes up during one of Solus's personal quests, in which he seems to know the truth of where her clan is, so I guess Felisan had told him that. Michelle and Imshell are in the Empress Du Lion, and you can actually help Michelle complete his goal of killing Imshell and then recruit him to the Inquisition. You can also do none of that and let Imshell live, to which he murders Michelle. And naturally, Gaspard, Briella, and Celine are a large part of the quest Wicked Eyes, Wicked Hearts. There are also a few other minor characters that appeared in the Heroes of Dragon Age mobile game, but eh. Speaking of Wicked Eyes, Wicked Hearts, Viper says, One thing that I noticed that really bothered me was the difference in Celine from the book to Inquisition. The main thing that I have a problem with is that after reading the book, I've realized that she never stops playing the game with the Inquisitor. I don't know why, but I assume that since we saved her life, saved the throne, saved her empire, and potentially set her up together with her elven slave whose family she killed, yikes, and that the Inquisitor is not our legion and one step below the Maker, she would act as a little more genuine towards the Inquisitor. After seeing her completely vulnerable to Briala and even Michelle de Chavin, you can see that she is clearly constantly playing the game with the Inquisition and is being very cautious of their alliance, even if at a high approval slash close connections. He then does go on to say that it makes sense from a political standpoint, but that it still caught him off guard. And I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, man. This is the same woman who killed the parents of her lover and then lied to her face about it for about half her life and did so up until there was absolutely no way out of the lie. So, of course she's going to play the Inquisitor. Uh, yeah, that that seems... makes sense to me. Selene's kind of an asshole, man. <laughs> From Matilda, I really love reading the Mazd Empire in general, but what has really resonated with me is that this is the only one of the books that will directly affect how I play the games. I both love knowing more about Selene, Briella, and Gaspard, and hate knowing more than my Inquisitor would. I feel in some way it's having an impact on the role-playing experience of the game. And I think this is one of the major downsides to the novel. While some do like going into a game with meta information, like me, some do not. It can be hard to choose when you think your Inquisitor would choose one ruler, but you really want to choose another one due to information your Inquisitor wouldn't have. From Christy, I now have a different perspective of Inquisition after reading The Vast Empire. After reading the book, I did play through Origins of Dragon Age 2 with a perspective of how I wanted my games to go. Seriously wish Patrick Weiss would put down a book on the Dread Wolf. Now Christy does bring up a good point here. If there will be another novel, it should be coming out pretty soon. Now Bioware has been pretty heavy on the comics lately, so maybe they're doing comics instead of novels now. And one was technically planned about Fenris and was written by David Gator, but that had been scrapped apparently. Now we do know that Weeks has been writing another novel, but he has not said if it's for his job at Bioware or one of his other standalone series. At this point, it's really just a waiting game if we're going to get another novel or not. And finally, we have Flukas, who has been listening to the audiobooks and sent this along. On the sarcophagus, 
Michel remembered the feeling when the Danish elves had fallen into their trance when they had freed him and ignored him. This isn't the first time the audiobooks have mispronounced the Dalish. In an earlier novel, The Stone Throne, they were called the Dalish, so this just goes to show you, don't use audiobook pronunciation, kids. The novel. Let's talk cover art. I have to say, out of all the covers, this is honestly probably my favorite, even if it doesn't represent the novel too well. You can tell the devs actually really liked it too, as it's the only cover to appear in-game as artwork. This is how I imagine Selene in my mind, with an icy cold stare. And while you can tell that her in-game model really tried to capture this image, it just doesn't quite capture it as well as the cover does. You got hands helping her dress, crowning her, even petting her, but also about to cut her. While there's absolutely no source or proof for this, I chose to read this as almost the hands of Briala and the other servants. Selene may be the figurehead, but the things that keep her in her position are these hands, her servants. Unlike the rest of the covers in the series, however, this is the only one that doesn't really have a back to it. On my copy, it's just black or a very dark navy with a bit of an awkward border of the background pattern on the cover. The book was released on April 8th, 2014, about eight months before Dragon Age Inquisition came out. It was unrated as a 4.4 out of 5 stars, which ties it currently with The Calling, making it tied for second best book of the series, according to Amazon at least. As for my personal ranking, I'm honestly a bit torn. I will say that when first reading the novels, this was my favorite by Leagues. Only after I really began to grow attached to the characters in the series did other novels like Asunder and The Stolen Throne really click with me. My main complaint about the novel was that it did drag in some places, those being mainly in between the Battle of Halm Sheral and when the heroes met Imshale. Another minus for the novel was that a lot of the action rested on caring about who takes the crown for Vorlay or not, and having played the games before reading the novel, it really sucked a lot of the tension out of if the group will survive or not. You probably know going in that most of the cast survives into the game. In fact, unlike the other novels, pretty much every main character of the cast who is not dead appears in the game, which itself is a bit unusual. Now, there's also a lot of complaints about the relationship between Briella and Celine, as while the book is dated to LGBTQ fans, the two are hardly an admirable couple. On the pros, pretty much the whole cast are kind of terrible people, and I really like that. Briella and Felisana are the only two who don't have any huge negatives to them, and I'm sure that's only because the book doesn't talk about it. And while I know a lot of people don't like that about the book, I found that a really interesting point to it. In real life, terrible people do have a decent side to them, like Espard and his honor, while decent people do have a terrible side to them, like Michelle and his treatment of the elves. Despite what they have done, I ended up liking both characters a lot. Even Imshale is fun. I found myself liking most of the characters, even if they had done terrible things, and questioning what I value in people and how much I should be willing to forgive of a person's past, which seems like a constant theme of the novel. On a more personal note, I really love bad relationships. I find how they work and how each other partner rationalizes their bad behavior fascinating, and reading each side of Briella and Selene's relationship was probably one of the highlights of the novel for me. Also, I just love the mystery behind who Felisan is and what he is doing. So after a lot of soul searching and examining my thoughts on this novel, I think I really do want to keep this as my number one slot for Dragon Age novels at the moment. While I do think Gator edges out as the better writer, I think Weeks edges out as the better storyteller. But that being said, I was really tempted to give it the number one slot to Asunder. Mess Empire I think just ended up winning because I, I just really liked the elven subplot and romantic relationship just a bit more than mages and a mother-son relationship. But just a bit though, they're both really good. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next. If you have any comments, artwork, anything else, please send it in. Our next section will consist of chapters 1 through 8 of the last novel, The Last Flight. So please send me your things by February 3rd, 2019. Either comment below, send me an email at gildothalon at gmail.com, tweet at gildothalon on Twitter, or PM user Gillenon on Reddit. Duress your all.